Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Wilson Center on International Women's Day. We have some sun, which is pretty exciting today. <laughs> but I understand we're supposed to have snow this afternoon or something of the sort. So I'm Gwen Young, and I'm the director of the Global Women's Leadership Initiative and the Women in Public Service Project here at the Wilson Center. And our goal, I'll just start right off, is to ensure that by 2050, women hold 50% of leadership positions in governments across the globe. Today, and to this end, we are working with political and other partners, including the Center for American Women in Politics at Rutgers, to answer this question. Is this year the year women leaders break through the barriers in elected office in the U.S. to achieve higher representation in government? I hope so. As you've seen, 2018 has been hailed the year of the woman. And early evidence suggests that an unprecedented number of women are stepping up for office. My figures are approximately 400 at this point. So today we want to discuss who are these women? Where do they come from? Why are they running? And will they win? So our first panel here today is going to set the stage. I would like to welcome Kelly Dittmar, Assistant Professor and Scholar at Rutgers University Center for American Women in Politics, Emily Liner, the Front Runner Chair for She Should Run, and Carol McDonald, the Vice Chair of the Board of Directors for Higher Heights. So welcome, everybody. Hey, thank you. Let me, let me set the stage a little bit, because this is important in the U.S., not just because we're in the U.S., but where the U.S. is globally, as today is International Women's Day. So we rank, according to the Interparliamentary Union and, and the Global Women's Leadership Initiative Index, 104th in the world for women's representation in parliament out of 193 countries measured. Mediocre. I would, yeah, mediocre. There you go. The <laughs> right in the middle. I was gonna say, so how do we feel about that, right? And I think we hold about 19.8 per seat of the seats in Senate. Right, mm -hmm. and so we're 19.3 percent in the House of Representatives, and we've been hovering. Mm -hmm. I think the highest we've gone is 22 percent, or have we gone a bit. We higher? haven't been uh, over 20 percent. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> we have only six governors. Mm -hmm. Currently, we have six to be six African American women mayors. Yes, is that it? In cities. In, in, in cities. cities. So we're doing okay. We're doing okay. So I'll start with you, Kelly. What are you seeing? What does this year look like in terms of kind of internationally and some of the other numbers I talked about? Yeah, so um, I think, so first of all, thanks for having us. Um, we're really excited about this opportunity to partner. We've partnered with all of these organizations, but particularly with Politico and um, the Women Public Service Project um, this year to look at um, the numbers of women that are running, um, but also think about how, what are the challenges that they face. So we do know sort of as of yesterday, um, our numbers for women running uh, are likely to be running because filing deadlines haven't passed in Congress are um, 420 uh, in Congress, uh, in the House, uh, 50 for uh, running for the Senate, and in the, for gubernatorial races, we're up to 80 potential women candidates. Um, these are all record setting. In other words, if these women and actually go on to file will surpass our previous records at all of those levels for the number of women who filed for office. Um, and so to that point, there is this high level of energy. The, the context for that, though, I think is really important to thinking about how we will increase those numbers come November and how we all talk about this story. And there's a couple things to pay attention to. One is that this surge or the pink wave is also very blue. Um, almost all of the increases among Democratic progressive women, and many of those women are running as challengers against incumbents. And many of those are running against each other in primaries. So we're going to see these numbers go down. And I want to preface that not to be the wet blanket, but so that when we tell the story in November about how many women win, if we don't see 50% in Congress, uh, people aren't all of a sudden shocked. So there is important context for those numbers. And then secondly, thinking about the diversity of the women. So not only partisan diversity, but racial and ethnic diversity. I think there's a lot of opportunities this year to see growth growth in that representation. We saw it in Texas with, um, it's likely that we'll elect the first two Latinas um, from Texas. Um, and we're also going to look at our statewide races to see um, women of color running for governor. We have not yet elected any woman of color Democrat as a governor in this country. 
So I'm going to look at you. Who who are some of these women from from where you sit, and and what are they? You know, what are your what are you seeing? Who are they? Where are they coming from? Tell me a little bit. Sure. So what's really exciting is that we are seeing women from every walk of life raise their hands and say that they want to run for office. Um, at She Should Run, we are a nonpartisan nonprofit dedicated to expanding the talent pool of women in elected office, um, and we are seeing you know. Everyone from attorneys that you would traditionally expect it to be a politician to moms who don't have, you know, a, you know, necessarily a traditional professional resume. Um, and what we tell women is what you've done in your life already, that experience is what qualifies you to represent your communities. You don't need another degree. You don't need another credential. You don't need more volunteer experience. You're ready to go no matter what you've done in your life. Um, so we are seeing women running at all levels of government. And what's really exciting is last year in 2017, even though it was an off year, we had 88 women in the She Should Run community win elections. Um, and that's, you know, school board, state legislature, you know, and now we are going to see um, She Should Run alumni running for congressional seats and, you know, other offices in this year. Um, so we're really excited to see that. We have a community of 17,000 women who are interested in running for office, and they come from every state and every walk of life. Fabulous. Carol, from where you sit, what are you seeing? And, you know, not just the diversity angle, but that's very important in this race as well. Yeah. So um, I think it's really important. To, um, you know, I think looking at what women are doing writ large is um, obviously is a, is a metric and is a barometer. Um, and it tells us something about where we are headed as a country. Um, but at higher heights, and first of all, raise your hand if you know what higher heights is. Okay, so um, let me set the stage a little bit then, and then I'll put uh, my comments into context. Um, so Higher Heights, the shorthand that I use, it's like the Emily's List for black women candidates. Um, but essentially, we are the political home for black women's political leadership. Uh, we focus on supporting black women running for office um, at any level, uh, and we also mobilize black women voters. Um, I have been a part of Higher Heights for seven years old now this year, and I've been on the board for six years, so almost since the very beginning. Um, and I will tell you, like, what's happening with black women politically, both as candidates and as voters, is a slightly different story than, um, than what's, uh, that's what, what's happening with white women. Mm -hmm. uh, so a little bit, like, let's go back to 16, because I know that some of us are still in pain about what happened in 2016. Uh, but that is actually one of the places where black women uh, the black women shown and it's it shined and it's one of the uh, the silver linings that we don't talk about enough in the 16 election. We elected more black women to Congress than year than ever before. Now again, those numbers are tiny uh, because of over the 12,000 people that have been elected to Congress since there has been a Congress to be elected to. Uh, there have only been 38 black women that have served in that Congress. So um, we are making incremental gains there. Uh, but even since the 2016 election, we now have more black women serving as mayors of major cities, and by major I mean um, the top 100 cities in terms of population. Um, so we're, we're making great strides there. Um, and Kelly talked about the fact that there's a vast diversity um, in um, women that are stepping up to run for office. So uh, at my last count, and I think my numbers might be a few weeks outdated, uh, but there have been 32,000 women across the country who have raised their hand and said that I'm going to run for office, whether it's at school board, state legislature, you know, whatever, dog catcher, <laughs> um, um, at all levels. Um, and the vast majority of those are people of color, and the vast majority of those are, are young. They're, you know, they're, they're 45 and younger. Um, so I think that's going to uh, significantly change the, uh, the, dy the dynamic. Um, you also talked about the fact that you know, this pink wave is blue, and these are, um, these are women that, that definitely lean more progressive and definitely lean more left. Um, the one thing that I really want to point out, though, and I think we saw it a little bit in, uh, well, we saw it a lot in the, um, the special election in Alabama a few months ago. Um, we even saw it in the, in the governor's race in Virginia in 2017. Black women have always voted an extraordinarily high rate. And in fact, uh, amongst any demographic, they have the highest turnout rate. And I need to, I wrote them on a note card because numbers are important here. Um, so uh, white women turned out in the last election at um, the rate of 48.2% uh, compared to white men at 41.3%, black men at 39.6%. And white women, ladies, what are we doing here? 36.9%. So 53% of y'all voted for Donald Trump. And 
there's not even that many of you that are turning out. So I think there's a discussion to be had. And, you know, I kind of say that um, tongue in cheek and being a little punchy about it. But we have to disaggregate what's happening within the different demographics among black women, vo uh, among women voters, because it's not the same story. Um, so yeah, I'll just, I'll, that's a long answer. I'll leave it there. Like I just in. wanted to, to jump in on, on this piece about, particularly for black women, and we are fortunate to have worked with Higher Heights on a report. We just put out an update. Um, it's the status of black women in American politics. This one we dedicated to Shirley Chisholm. Um, so it's got beautiful Shirley Chisholm <laughs> on the cover. Um, and we're talking about one of the other things that we have always talked about with Higher Heights in particular, is that looking, looking at the districts and the places where black women are being recruited and supported to run is really key because it's not that we don't we have black women that are energized and ready to run but they're often being pushed into majority minority districts only and not looked at as a statewide candidate as a candidate outside a majority minority district so the opportunity there to see growth particularly among black women but also women of color more broadly is really significant as we look to these future cycles and so Stacey Abrams at the statewide level if she can win um, hopefully that breaks through some of these ex these sort of false expectations that we women of color can't win at that level. So many things in that. <laughs> <laughs> but let, let's come back a, a bit because we sort of brought it up through various things. So wh why are these women running, right? Is this a reaction to 2016? Is this a desire for change? Is this simply a party thing? Now it's the time for the, the left progressive liberal Democrats, just to put a whole bunch of tags in there, mm -hmm. to run. What are, what are you seeing, and, and especially you know from some of these groups that you've got these women you're working with, why are why are they running? Mm -hmm. Emily, you look ready and poised. Well, you know, it's funny. I was just thinking, I was talking to my mom before I got here, and my mother told me something when I was a teenager that is kind of why I have gone into this line of work, and she said, um, you know, if you're going to complain, you need to be part of the solution. And I think that women everywhere are realizing that if they're the ones spotting the problems in their communities, that they are the best position to create the change they wish to see. Mm -hmm. Carol, what are your thoughts? Um, I mean, I do think there's a little bit of, if someone who has never held any public office before, um, who has some dubious qualifications for the business that he was in, can be the president of the United States, then why can't I serve on my, um, on my, my, my city council? Why can't I run for a governor? Why can't I serve on my school board? Um, so I do think you have a little bit of, uh, of that effect happening, that there's been a little bit of, uh, for better or for worse, um, the myth has been dispelled about what it takes to, to, to run for office. Um, I will say, though, and I think this, uh, this counts for women candidates writ large, um, which I have the, the good fortune of working with in my professional life, um, as well as uh, you know, for, uh, for women of color in particular, the barriers um, are still pretty staggering. Um, and the supports are, are fairly low. So when we look at... Um, traditional uh, political institutions and the way that they support women and women of color candidates. Um, you know, you brought up the example of Stacey Abrams. Uh, so Stacey Abrams, I think everybody here in the room knows, is running for, um, for governor of Georgia, um, is poised to be, um, you know, could be the first, um, uh, the first yeah. black woman governor that this country has ever seen in its history. Um, she is far outraising um, her white primary counterpart. Um, she has a much higher national profile. Um, she has greater experience. I used to live in Georgia. That's where I cut my teeth in politics. So I actually know both of them personally. Um, but it is astounding how the political establishment in Georgia has mobilized against Stacey Abrams out of fear that they don't think that a black person or a black woman can run uh, can win statewide. Um, and the energy that they are that are, that are putting into erecting roadblocks on her candidacy. Um, I, I really want to sort of peel the, the cover off that a little bit and expose that a little bit more because it's shameful. Um, and the numbers don't um, don't support that fear. Um, but what I found in my 20 years in politics as a black woman doing this work, um, that a lot of what, a lot of the way that we approach these issues is less about what the evidence says, and it's much more about our own internal perceptions um, about race and about gender. Um, so just, I, I want to really highlight that the barriers are high. People are actively working uh, against some of the extraordinary candidates um, that we have out there. Um, and it's, um, it, that is something that we need to address. And I think when we talk about why women are running this year, one thing I want to sort of push us all to think 
beyond the singular narrative is that not 420 women didn't decide to run because of Donald Trump. Yep. Um, th these are women who have been working. They've been doing the work in their communities. They've been active in other ways. And they didn't just wake up and decide, I'm going to run. Now, you're going to get some stories in the media that are like, I went to the Women's March, and now I'm running. And that's wonderful. <laughs> but many of these women have been working at it. And so I hope that we also tell those stories about what was the path yeah. to running? What sort of barriers did they break through already? And I think this year provides both a sense of urgency that, like, I got to do it now and the support infrastructure might actually be more supportive in this moment opportunity where there's some more opportunities and I think there's some more pressure on some of the boys clubs to include more women in the pool absolutely and I think you know when you also start to break down sort of open seats and majority districts and sort of who's running for re-election which is a different side you know it's it, it's it's not one narrative right. for everybody and this seems like a nice time to sort of shift to the next panel to talk about some of these formal structures, what does the outlook look like, you know, sort of what's happening. Um, so I would love to move on to our second panel and welcome Carrie Duboff, the editor of Politico magazine, to moderate. We're going to do the panels first and then we can have some questions later. Um, and she's going to moderate a discussion between Andrea Bozak, Missy Agelski, and Margie Omero. So Carrie, welcome. We will definitely get some questions in. I will hold time for that for sure. Um, while folks get seated, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Carrie Budoff Brown. I'm the editor of Politico, um, and I'm really excited to be here. Uh, it's International Women's Day, which is uh, a great day to celebrate. Um, also today, we were announcing in a partnership, as as Gwen mentioned, uh, Politico is teaming up with Rutgers University, um, the Wilson Center, to essentially track in real time how women are doing this year uh, on the campaign trail. There are hundreds of women who have put their hand up. There's a lot of noise. Uh, there's a lot of ways I find in the media to sort of lose track of what's going on. And we're go going to be using this partnership through our site, uh, setting up an interactive news page that will essentially track in real time whether the needle is moving. Um, this is part of a effort that we've undertaken at Politico for years as part of our Women Rule series. It's events, editorial content, uh, a newsletter, a podcast, and really this year is an amazing time. We have this amazing surge of women interests, and we're really hoping to tell stories in real time, uh, as Gwen said, and Kelly and others, looking at the barriers, looking at the campaign, you know, the, the fundraising, the ads, uh, the reasons why women are are standing up. Um, and I'm going to shift to the conversation uh, with the with the panel. Um, I'm very interested in talking to them, in part because when we had our our last Women Rule um, Summit in no in December. We were asking the question, this was right after the election, I'm sorry, this was, you know, a year after the election of Donald Trump. Um, we were talking about sort of what the next midterm would look like. Uh, we were seeing the surge in women who were interested, and we were asking a panel of strategists at that point, you know, what this year would look like. There were folks who were, they were not sort of willing to make a prediction, but I feel like now we're closer to the end date, and I'm going to press these strategists who are on the ground worked veterans of political campaigns. Um, and uh, if you're going to listen to anybody, I would listen to these three women um, who are amazingly accomplished. Um, our first panelist is Missy Agelski. Did I say your name correctly? Good. Excellent. Uh, Missy is the uh, vice president of Greenberg Quinlan Rosner Research, uh, two decades of experience in polling and strategic advice. Uh, to political campaigns, including Senators Maggie Hassan and Jean Shaheen, two women who, what, they were the only two They're the, the only two women to ever have served as governor and U.S. senator. Yes, impressive women. Um, Andrea Bozek, to my left here, she's senior vice president of Mercury Buffalo. She's communications director at the National Republican Senatorial Committee in 2016. As you know, that was a very good year. Uh, for senators, uh, for the Republicans uh, in the Senate. Uh, she was a communications director at the NRCC, National Republican Congressional Committee, also right now working on the campaigns for Marsha Blackburn, who, as you know, is is uh, running for Senate. 
um, and Congresswoman Martha McSally and winning for women. She worked on Karen Handel's campaign last year, which to this to this date is she's the only woman right to win last year. Um, so you have Andrea there. And of course, Margie O'Mara, who uh, needs no introduction, a principal at the Democratic polling firm of GBA Strategies and co-host of the top rated podcast Pollsters. Mm -hmm. Check it out. Um, we did a whole <laughs> deep dive into Texas. We had a guest oh, co-host. It's bipartisan. I have a, a woman co-host, Kristen Soltis Anderson, but we yeah. had Dave Wasserman on, so he gets like in the weeds on Texas and mm -hmm. house well, races. And to that point, I mean, let's start there. I mean, Margie, would you like? We've had one night. What le like? What <laughs> lessons? <laughs> we what, know everything, yeah, right? We know everything. <laughs> like it's going to be a record-setting year. But in, in all reality, like what 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 is what are like the three top takeaways you know in this context the women context that you take away from tuesday well women did really well in texas yeah. mm -hmm. i mean women did incredibly well i think like over 50 percent of women won or maybe over 50 percent of the winners were women it was that like kelly is like ultimate mm -hmm. fact checker from afar now she's right here which is great and she's normally like my online yeah. fact checker when i'm writing about women's issues um so the, but that's pretty that's pretty incredible yeah. and obviously there are still runoffs and some of those runoffs have women running against each other you also have some candidates in these targeted seats in Texas where the very wealthy candidate did not win. Mm -hmm. This was in the targeted congressional races where a they're held by a Republican, but Clinton won them. And then kind of the bigger mm -hmm. story that we all want out of Texas is, you know, on the Democratic side is this, like, thing that's been going on for, like, almost decades. Like, Texas is going to turn yeah. blue. This is the day. No, today is the day. No, today is the day. <laughs> and then after Clinton was, you know, just came up short by nine points, points, which was, you know, n considering not it wasn't a battleground state, then it was seen as a sign as, well, maybe this, in fact, is the year you have, you know, it's what's seen as a exciting recruit in Beto O'Rourke and, and so on, um, you know, thinking that plus all these, you know, women in these suburban districts th in uh, metro areas in Texas meet and a woman, potentially a woman running for governor, you know, Lupe Valdez, uh, Latina woman who is uh, going to a runoff um, uh, in May. Uh, so it just sent, it's just a sense that maybe this is the year that Texas at least narrows the gap or Democrats can really win some seats back. It's also part of the larger story nationally, which is you have, you know, women excited to run everywhere. And some of them are women who seem like they've been, you know, coming from sort of traditional candidate profiles. And some of them are more, you know, kind of activist moms who've said, you know, I feel like running, I'm going to run for office because it's the, you know, why not me? Like, why not? Why shouldn't I do it this year? T to be a little bit of a downer, though, what I mean, what cautionary tales or, or signs have you seen so far? I would, I would like to put it to all three of you. I mean, we're all sort of, you know, pumped about the the obviously the the surge in interest but like what's like Andrea what <laughs> be a downer for me like yeah what, I had to what, be what, glass yeah. half empty but yeah, yeah, you know yeah. I hate to I think we're all encouraged by mm -hmm. the sort of um you know momentum and the energy out there with with women candidates both on both sides of the aisle um, you know, you mentioned the two candidates that I work for right now that are running for statewide office, and they have the opportunity to be the first women to hold um, federal office or uh, Senate office in Tennessee and Arizona. But, you know, I hate to draw some grand conclusion mm -hmm. off of one primary, yep. you know, night in Texas. So I think, you know, as important and I think, you know, this should be part of the discussion, too, as important as it is to, you know, it's sort of only half the battle to get women to run but we have to get them to win yeah and that is is really difficult and so what is that what does that gap look like f for you I mean you're yeah. you're in the midst of and we were talking before this before the panel Marsha Blackburn nearly <laughs> had to face off again against Bob Corker yeah. who 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 for a week you know said he was going to retire and then decided he was going to maybe get back in and I thought that was a, a very interesting case where Andrea actually came out hard. Well, I guess Marsha did, but came out hard saying, is this an instance, you know, instance of like, uh, you know, sexual, you know, like sexism, right? Yeah. And so that's like one micro, like one small example of what of the, the barriers, is, the barrier. Right. So what is that barrier that you see for Marsha, 
for and for Martha. For Martha, yeah. Writing press releases for both those yeah. two candidates, I get really <laughs> I nervous. That. I'm gonna like mess yeah. it up. Yeah. Martha and Marsha. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I think that was very disappointing for me um, professionally. That whole instance mm-hmm. a couple weeks ago. Um, you know, by any metric that we judge a candidate in a campaign, um, Marsha is doing phenomenal. She's raised two million dollars last quarter the best fundraiser of Republican candidate, man or woman in the entire country, um, raised more than Ted Cruz. And, you know, she's never won statewide office. She's never run statewide office before. No money has been spent. And she's only, um, you know, within the margin of error against the um, former Democrat governor who was, um, you know, a great candidate um, in Tennessee. And there were some, I think very few, but it got a lot of publicity in the, in the Republican party that were saying that, oh, she couldn't win the general election, which is just mind boggling, you know, um, to me. So I think, you know, it was a small, hopefully number of people that, um, you know, didn't like her, didn't want, you know, to see a woman run, you know, I I hate to say that, but I, I think it was that. And so, yeah, we, we put out a pretty powerful quote, and at the end of the day, he decided not to run because there was a lot of um, pushback from um, a lot of people, not only in Tennessee, but in, in Washington, that um, felt that that sort of criticism was out of place. So, um, you know, I think she's going to have a great campaign and ultimately win. But, you know, that's that's a barrier that she shouldn't have had to deal with. And we lost two weeks of fundraising. And, you know, it just makes it even harder when you have to focus the entire campaign on that sort of Mm-hmm. you know, issue. And so that's just, you know, one example of yeah. the different barriers that women candidates face on both sides of the aisle, I think. And Missy, as as someone who just, you know, helped two women win mm-hmm. these statewide offices, um, what is your what is your advice to women running in this year uh, based on your experience running these campaigns? Like what is the best two piece of, pieces of advice? I mean, I, th- I think that a lot of it is just, make, you know, going out and mm-hmm sort of presenting your authentic story and really just putting aside a lot of the noise and it's very difficult because I mean I think to Andrea's point you know there's people that you know very credentialed women that are that are running and and still get this like well she can't really win though in in the end and so (laughs) and we're running you know in in a lot of races as much as it's exciting how many women are running there are a lot of men running in these primaries too we have a lot of you know, can you know primaries with six or seven different people because you know they sort of smell like maybe there's this blue wave coming and we're all going to get in there and then you get into the women where they they have to deal with well it's not your turn yet mm-hmm. like you know these these guys like they they've been waiting so it's their turn and and so what do you say to your to, to women who, who I, you hear I that mean, from potential clients yeah it's it's we don't we don't I mean we just you you put that aside that's mm-hmm. not there's no it's my turn. Um, yeah, you, know, you have your own qualities, and you know, we we talked about the, before the panel about, um, you know, what you know, being a mom or you know, being on the school yeah. board. What's what's qualifies you? Your your experiences qualify you, and you know. What do you hear most often from women when they're considering running, um, and how do you move them past those feelings of? I can't do this. I think there is a concern about experience. Um, You know, I think Jennifer Lawless, who I'm sure folks have read, um, you know, tells this anecdote. And I know I've seen other folks, uh, uh, Womenomics or one of those other books where like women who feel that women are more likely to feel that they don't have the right experience, that they may fall a little bit short while men may fall a little short of what they think is required, but still say, you know, why not me? Right. So I think there's this there's a little bit of a worry, but I don't want to overstate that because I think, you know, I think there are men who probably secretly feel that they're not up for whatever it is, whatever job they're running for. But, you know, I just did a training with some women and and they in, in thinking about what their challenges would be, they also they all seem to think that they would be accused of not having enough experience. And I was like, it would be great if someone challenged you on your lack of experience because you've only done X, Y, and Z things. Think instead about what you've said publicly about this issue or have you mm-hmm. taken some position that's not at odds with the district. Those are the things that are going to be likely more of a challenge than someone saying, oh, well, you haven't you know, had 30 years yeah. doing this job like I have because this is not a time anymore where that's good enough. You know, that, that kind of argument doesn't work for men or women particularly. If that's what you have to say, you're, you're probably, you know, you're missing out on connecting 
connecting with your voters. And if you're really able to go out and meet people and connect with them and have a story and an approach and set of issues and make them feel that you're on their side, then you have a good shot, whether you have 30 years of experience or five or zero. And, you know, the other point that I want to make, too, when we're thinking about these women candidates, and it's not like all women candidates just sort of come from the same cloth and they all look the same, just like all women voters do. It's definitely not the case. Some of the women who are running are Obama administration folks who, you know, ha are, are seasoned policy experts who are running for office be for the reasons men run for office. They have the policy experience they want to continue to work on, whatever their set of issues is. And then you have sort of the, you know, citizens who are just mad about whatever, Donald Trump or something else. Um, e e and that's on the Democratic side. I know all Republican women don't all, they're, they're not all cut from the same cloth either. And the other thing is, you know, they don't need to be better. Women candidates don't need to be better than men candidates for us to say they des we deserve parity. They, you know, we just deserve parity. They could yeah. be, you know, like the Nora Ephron quote, like, I could do that, you know, I decided to direct because I realized I could do that just as badly as somebody else. <laughs> and it's the same thing. It's yeah. the, you know, there's no, it, exactly. it's, they're, they're not, we don't need yeah. to lionize them as, you know, this superior class of candidates. They can be just as yeah. wonderfully flawed as everyone else. You know, and to, to, to Margie's point about, you know, experience at the federal level right now, it's not necessarily a great thing that, you know, you've been in politics for 20 years or 25 years and, you know, people are kind of just down at an epic level. Yeah. Um, you know, I wanted to ask the three of you, a question posed to the three of you, uh, given the, the Me Too moment um, and men in both parties uh, stepping down due to misbehavior. Um, is there any evidence in your polling or just from what you're seeing that women candidates will benefit from gender this cycle or that there could be some sort of hidden backlash <laughs> to women, which we're just not aware of yet? I mean, maybe not to women, but to the, you know, this, you know, there's been a lot of commentary about whether we're going to, there's stories are going too far with forcing men out of positions, even some women. We've written about women who have who've misbehaved as well and, and have had to step down, but you know, is there any evidence that you're seeing this is the gender is going to benefit, uh, be a benefit in this cycle in any particular way? I don't know that there's specific, like the polling yeah. numbers, I say, you know, that we're testing, like yeah. I'm going to vote for this woman because she's a woman. But there there does seem to be, you know, at a time where the, the academic research always said that, you know, women don't necessarily vote for women candidates just because they're women. Mm -hmm. That's, it's, it's, you know, it's about their issues and, and agenda. But there does seem to be more openness right now, you know, in, in races we're doing and in primaries where we're doing where there's men and women, um, where, mm -hmm. you know, with equal lack of ID, name ID that the women seem to have a little bit of a bump. Um, mm -hmm. And I've seen in the past where, you know, I think that people think that women as far as decision makers and they, they bring to government a, a different kind of, um, you know, attitude and willingness to work with people and and so and I think it may it may it, you know the Me Too movement yielding more candidates may may actually have some impact. Andrew do you have any? What yeah from think? a from a purely political um, standpoint you know I think we have women have an opportunity um, especially in Minnesota with Al Franken seat there's two women running both from Republican and Democrat side um, for the seat so that's one that we wouldn't have had before, right? So I think from a purely like numbers perspective, sure. that's important. And then on the you know the other side, we we for the, because of I think the Me Too moment, Republicans lost a seat in Alabama, um, so now we're down a seat in the United mm -hmm. States Senate because of the whole Roy Moore issue. Um, so from a purely political standpoint, you know, there's both parties are sort of. Um, you know, suffering, so to speak, mm -hmm. with the different open seats. And maybe that is an opportunity, I think that is an opportunity for um, women to run, you know, to be, uh, you know, um, a voice for for the movement um, on both sides of the aisle. I think it's important. And um, maybe we can get some more women in Congress because I mean, of there it. was the really incredible viral ad for yeah. uh, Michigan Attorney General candidate, um, yeah. Dina, Dana, Dana. 
is she one of your I was like I was like who I was like I was like (laughs) it was a terrible ad no it was looked like (laughs) it was a ridiculous it was a ridiculous ad because it looked like you know she asked her like dog to be the camera dog right it was like the worst production values you know ever but it was and it was completely crazy but she just wanted to go viral on the primary so like I'm basically I'm never going to grope you but it was more R-rated than that and so (laughs) I don't know like that's it tell people about the ad so the ad was like you know, she's like, I'm never, you know, you're going to vote for me because I, you know, don't have any, I'm not, I shouldn't say that. Like, I'm not going to grope anyone. I'm never going to show anyone my body, right? She was a little bit more R-rated I'm not going to open the door in, like, my pajamas like a lot yeah. of men seem to do. Yeah, recently. right. Like, I mean, it was she really, and it was, in fact, I'm a prosecutor and I've taken on, like, child molesters. Like, mm-hmm. she actually had to pivot to some messaging, but it was done. Has that helped her of, at all? Like, what's been the effect? I have no race? idea, but she made, it's, like, a zillion people It's not a primary. She's, it's a convention. Right. So, got it. So, but, got it. so but she it, had to, it, you know, it, it was viral in a way that it stands out, and, and it's try. I don't know if it helped her in actual real anything, because okay. who cares if I'm watching it you know yeah. here right that doesn't really help her so but it, it is an ex- like one of the few examples I can think of of a woman saying we need to vote for a woman because a woman is not going to behave inappropriately I don't think that's a message that anybody else is going to do and I don't think that you know what happens with Al Franken or Minnesota affects McSally right the people are like well I need to vote for McSally because of Al Franken I don't think that works mm-hmm. like that um, for you know in any direction right so but but what it is it does do is you know and call, shines a light on some of these issues I think a danger for women candidates and women voters across the board is you know this is not you know the, it's important that we have a conversation about these me too issues it's ultimately and a lot of women are on board with new protections and laws and we did this study for business forward uh, sexual harassment was not seen as the top obstacle that women face in their lives. Those obstacles are still going to be economic. Mm-hmm. It, they they always were and they are now, even as we continue to have these conversations about sexual misconduct and harassment in the workplace. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that women across party lines don't actually support making it easier for whistleblowers, you know, whistleblower mm-hmm. protections, because they do. It's still very widely supported and people don't want predators in leadership positions, but it doesn't mean that that women all across, you know, across the party lines wake up every day thinking about sexual harassment. It's just, this has just caught yeah. fire as a way to kind of expose the challenges women face. So Andrea, you know, to that point, as you know, a Republican strategist helping elect Republican women as well as others, um, what, how challenging is it for a Republican woman with Donald Trump and sort of the, the issues he's had to confront with women, um, what what kind of special challenge does that uh, pose to Republican women? Yeah, um, I think you know it really depends on the state and the race that you're in. Mm-hmm. You know whether you're getting asked on a daily basis about whatever's going on in the White House, mm-hmm. but I think that applies to both Republican women and men. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I media train both uh, candidates and, and they have them? to <laughs> well we'll keep those questions <laughs> private but you know it really depends what race they're running in mm-hmm. and what they can say and if they're still in a primary mm-hmm. um but I think you know m- most importantly is to really focus on them and their backgrounds and their candidacy mm-hmm. and um you know why they're running mm-hmm. and what makes them different than their opponent is really sh- if you are seeing if you you know, sort of answer the daily question of whatever's going on in the White House, then you're not talking about your campaign message, and that's yeah. a mistake. So from a communications standpoint, um, you know, whether it's Donald Trump or anything going on, you should be always, you know, be able to bridge back to your message. And mm-hmm. so that's, you know, sort of what I, um, you know, tell Republican Does candidates that are running. Does it require w- women to run any differently in this environment? I don't, do I don't think so, no. Um, I, I think, you know, Look at we have, you know. I think one of the reasons why Senator Corker didn't get back in the race is because he was didn't have maybe the support that he would have liked from the White House, and and Congressman Blackburn did, and she, um, you know, was one of the president's number one supporters. Um, stood with him through thick and thin, and uh, <laughs> voted for tax cuts. <laughs> you know, and was there was there on voting records, unlike. Uh, Senator Corker. So I think that actually played to her benefit. You know, as I, and I'm going to get to questions in one minute so folks can prepare uh, for that. Do you think maybe four years ago or even two years ago you might have not hit back using gender uh, when Bob Corker was thinking of getting back in the race? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, 
I don't know if that would have been our go-to first line of attack. Yeah, first line of attack. But that sort of goes back to the this you know Me Too conversation that we're having right now, and it's a and it's a powerful one, and it's you know for the first time in I think a, a very long time we're talking about these issues of sexual harassment and sexual abuse, which I think is important um, to to highlight. Mm-hmm. And that was obviously a, a real live example. I'd love to get some questions from the audience. We have a microphone over here if you want to raise your hand. Uh, we have both sides. We have this young woman. Hi. <coughs> Excuse me. Sonia Michelle from the University of Maryland. Um, Thetis, the sociologist Theda Scotchpole has really recently written an article in Democracy about the importance of kind of grassroots organizing among women and their networks. And I just wonder. And there, some of them are running for office, but not necessarily. A lot of them are just canvassing or, or trying to lobby or address a lot of local issues or state issues. And I just wonder if that comes into your, uh, on your radar screen at all. How important do you think these networks are uh, going to be for the women candidates? Yeah, I, th- I think they're going to be um, r- very important. And I think we uh, there's also an opportunity on the digital side um, to sort of create a grassroots m- movement um, online. Um, part, one of the organizations that I work for is um, – uh, winning for Women, which uh, helps promote right of center women candidates. Um, and our goal is to sort of create this digital sort of gra- root, grassroots network that can help support women candidates that are running, um, obviously with fun, not only with, um, you know, grassroots, but also um, fundraising as well. So I think, um, listen, I think grassroots is a fundamental part of any campaign. And if you're not doing that, obviously, in in uh, collaboration with a lot of other strategies, you're you're making a mistake. Yeah, I mean, I've definitely seen women do well, and men, but women also do well. You know, you do your initial poll, and nobody's done any tele- advertising, mail or other advertising. And, you know, the woman who has been on the ground doing stuff has hard ID and, you know, some elevated support. Now, can you kind of crush and, you know, get to 70% just on based on your local network? That's usually not a way for a you know for a larger race that's usually less possible but it certainly is a foundation it's also how women kind of move up the pipeline and get recruited and that sort of thing I think I mean one other thing is that you know what what has been helpful I think in the last year or so and uh, you know since 2016 is that grassroots movement and the you know being sustaining of that that movement and the indivisible groups has helped you know in local elections in 2017 definitely helped with turnout and energy and keeping that going um, I think is helpful for for progressive candidates at least yeah. right here Thank you all very much, Lucy Getman, Women in Government. Since half the women in Congress were state legislators earlier in their careers, do we think we'll move the needle at the state level and start building up that pipeline to Congress? I think that might be a good question. I was was like, that's for Kelly. Kelly. That's for (laughs) Kelly. (laughs) I'd like to come. (laughs) Yeah, feel free to. Um, Yeah, so I mean, we're. We're already tracking um, and starting to put up our candidates at the state legislative level. And so we saw um, in, if you just look at 2017, right? So if we look at Virginia um, and the increase we saw in women's representation and as well the diversity of that representation in, in Virginia, We hope that that bodes well. Um, And the energy that everybody's talking about in terms of, you know, I I got engaged. I feel like this is the moment. I feel like I need to be there and I'm qualified because these guys aren't doing the job. Um, Our our sense is that it's happening, and I'm sure yours is too, that it's happening at the state legislative level. So we'll be tracking that um, as well at (laughs) cop.records.edu. Well, while we wait for another question, I just want to ask, what, what, is, what is the impact on 2020? Like, what's your prediction on, on women, the chance of there being, you know, a nominee who's a woman either in 2020 or 2024? Um, and what's that barrier? What did we learn from 2016 that any woman candidate should take and absorb as we head into 2020? 
I mean, there are like a billion lessons from yeah. 2016, and they could you could follow a- any of them to some different yeah. down mm-hmm. a different road to someplace else. You know, I, I think we need to think about you know there's women candidates, women voters, and women's issues, and women candidates are important. It is not the only you know it is not solely the most important thing. The exposing the light and making sure we are talking about women's issues and bringing more women's voices to our political conversation is something that's happening, um, and then making sure women voters have the political harnessing the political power that they actually have in numbers and we see that happening obviously in lots of places so you know so I think bringing all those together is what's important for a woman Mm -hmm. to be successful in 2020 and I think also a piece of it is not you know having a message that is centered around gender it can be not that gender should be removed but a, like an it's our time kind of message or it's time we had a woman kind of message or you know are you saying they should do that they should not do should that. not do that. that's okay. not you know because it, it even even because you do you find hillary clinton did too much of that well no i'm you know i didn't say i don't think that she did but i do think and it was obviously trump mm-hmm. is a challenge and you know i think it, you know there's a challenge in talking about his extremist rhetoric on race and gender and everything else without making people who are supporters of him feel defensive Mm -hmm. and that was a challenge in 16 and that's a challenge as we as people continue to try to discuss where he is whilst you know how do you talk about that in a way that it's embracing and inclusive of people who have voted for him or feel supportive of him but doesn't make Mm. folks who feel attacked by him continue Mm -hmm. to feel threatened which is also important so so that's a you know that's would you put up a woman not put up a woman sorry you know it's up i'm in charge right and so um no but but for Democrats, <laughs> in charge, but <laughs> but Missy, for Democrats, I mean, to to Margie's point, um, if you if a woman emerges as the nominee in twenty twenty against Donald Trump, it, it would seem to be hard to avoid some of those tendencies. Even you know the Hillary Clinton adopted. Well, I'm, I'm sure that they'll yeah. come back. It'll look, yeah. we can't we can't run a woman again because you know a, a woman wa- lost once, so uh-huh. because men have Do never we? lost, you know. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> Right. Uh, but I mean, th- yeah. the question will come up, and it's something that you know a woman candidate will have to, you know, Elizabeth Warren or Kirsten Gillibrand. Do you think Democrats will be reluctant to nominate a woman, given the last nominee was a woman, and maybe there are issues attached to being a woman that kept her from getting over the finish line in the electoral college? I mean, I think it's heavily dependent on the field, which is, you know, I, Trump. I think Trump had you know a little bit of an advantage coming out of this with giant. Republican field where he had a lane that was able to sort of crowd everyone out and right now it looks like there are a lot of people that are thinking about running for president on the Democratic Mm -hmm. side and so if there's a few women and um, how that shakes out is important. I think we had a question here. We have a couple. Good morning. Julia Burroughs with the Governing Institute and so my question is, is this the year of the woman donors? Hmm. So we have issues, candidates, voters, but is this also when women are going to open their checkbooks and give more as a result of this wave? Mm -hmm. And I think that's personally very, very important. So how much of the two million raised in the last quarter was from women donors? Um, I I gotta be honest, I don't have that figure off the top of my head. Um, They keep me out of the (laughs) of the fundraising donor calls but yeah I mean god that would be huge and I think that's part of something that we're trying to do at winning for women is is sort of activate um you know the right of center woman donor who might not have had a place to go before and maybe they don't want to support you know necessarily a single candidate just want to support more right of center woman candidates and Finally, we can, you know, have an organization that sort of promotes um, right of center women candidates. Um, so that's what we're hoping to sort of build with that organization. Um, but I think, um, you know, women, you know, can take part in the political process, not just by running for office. I think by, you know, engaging with these candidates um, and going to the fundraisers and, and that sort of stuff, it can be pretty powerful. So I hope so. Missy, what did you see in in New Hampshire on donors? On women donors? donors, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm thinking about 2016. It was a, it's a little bit overwhelming because the money just came from everywhere. everywhere. Yeah, it was. Um, I, we didn't, you know, I don't know the breakdown of men men versus women donors either. But you know, I mean, it was interesting because it was a race with two two 
women candidates who are both statewide office holders and so that really mm -hmm. was I, it was a little bit of a yeah. different because they're just I mean I, they spent a hundred and twenty million dollars jeez <laughs> in, the, in that wow. center race um, so I want to give a little bit of an anecdote to that, and I think that um, that Kelly actually has some data to share around what uh, what donors are doing. So I can tell you that particularly in 2017 for my organization um, and some of the other candidates that I've worked with, there's been a tremendous outpouring from, um, from women donors and women who have not traditionally given to political candidates before political causes in the past. Um, and I, there, I think there is a little bit of, I feel weird, That's back okay, to you. Right. <laughs> and there is a little bit of a convergence also between what's happening with Me Too. We're getting a lot of interest from women in tech and women in Hollywood, um, who again, are not necessarily, necessarily your traditional political donors and political players, um, who wanna play a much bigger role now because they see the, the impact that they can have. And Kelly, I would love for you to share some of the, the numbers that you have. So I just wanted to plug somebody else, which is the Center for Responsive Politics. They did a study on the first six months of 2017 to try to look at what those donors look like. And already they were seeing an increase in the proportion of Democratic women giving, um, or the proportion of Democratic giving, I'm sorry, that was to that was from women. Uh, and so that's just a notable stat that they'll be watching. And I know they're mm -hmm. doing this throughout the cycle. Great. Good. Yes, sir. John Martin, I'm a <coughs> public policy fellow here and a retired journalist, and I, um, I'm wondering if the answer to no, we don't want to run another woman this year would be, well, the last woman we ran won the popular vote for the presidency of the United States. Yeah, that's, that's why I said she, she uh, fell short in the electoral college, because yes, that's a good point. Um, what would you say to that? I mean, you know, look, there's lots of answers to the, well, we can't run another woman. I mean, obviously, like, people want, you know, Hillary Clinton will be, is different than any of the women who are mm -hmm. being discussed. And yeah. I don't mean that as a, a – and that just – you know, they have different – you know, she comes with – uh, a you know established base mm -hmm. as opposed to someone new is going to be introducing themselves for the first time, mm -hmm. running against you know a Trump with a different record than the sort of unknown Trump. While in office, he'll be different, you know. Wish that I think some folks had, um, which you know was turned out to not be true. Um, so you know I think it's going to be completely you know there'll be a zillion things to say if there's a woman nominee and the main thing is who gets people excited who gets mm -hmm. Democrats excited who gets voters excited who gets you know who captures the imagination and of, of voters of, around the country and is able to not just have a you know whatever their views his or her views may be in terms of issues is able to say like what's happening in Washington is really toxic and we need to be able to get beyond it. And that's something that a progressive or a conservative can say because at both Democrats and Republicans agree that Washington has just gone crazy. So how do you find someone who could say like, we're, we're gonna really get beyond that and find some way that's unifying regardless of what their issue set is? I think we're almost at time, um, yes. <laughs> um, we'll do just one more quick question, if you don't mind, and then we'll wrap up. Good morning, Aries Mentor. I'm a National Defense Fellow here at the Wilson Center. Evelyn T. Butts, she is a Virginia woman who um, uh, never graduated high school, whose husband returned from World War II, 100% disabled. Um, and so she took, she took on a job as a seamstress to be able to raise her children. And when she went to vote, she couldn't afford, afford the poll tax. So she sued the state of Virginia, and she helped get the poll tax for Virginia overturned. So how do we communicate to more women today that a woman like Evelyn, who had the least amount of power in her community, was able to turn her passion into mobilizing others, not only to get the poll tax overturned, but also to mobilize others to vote? How do we help women understand that that experience and that passion can help them make changes in their community? Thank you. <laughs> Andrea? Um, that's a tough one. <laughs> I don't know if I'm an expert on that. I think... Um, I mean, listen, this is the what she did is where we as, you know, political operatives need to be looking for the next bright star in whatever party you're in. And so 
I don't know what the answer is, but I think there has to be some sort of like network or data database where those sorts of women are being cataloged in some way. And there obviously it depends on their political party, but that where we can, you know, start reaching out. And I, I know that's for sure not happening on the Republican side of things. And, um, you know, it's something that has always been a goal of mine is to sort of you know, look at where where is the farm team, and 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 it really starts with people who, you know, go to their first town board meeting because they're upset about some issue that's going on. Like that first step to walk into that town board meeting, I think is is really important, um, and we need to be identifying those women and, and supporting them. Would either of you like to add anything? No, I, just, I mean, I think that the the grassroots stuff that we've been talking about is is an important part of that, and you know, th- those are the women that are you know, maybe weren't as involved in politics or in policy before and, you know, have decided to take a stand for, you know, whatever reason, whether it was Trump or just something that they saw and, you know, building out from there. I mean, women of color helped get Ralph Northam elected. Women of color helped get Doug Jones elected. Women of color won their primaries in Texas or are going to probably come to Congress. I mean, this is a really big story of 2018, not just about women overall, but women of color. And it's important for us to, you know, continue, you know, it, to think about what this means for Democratic Party in particular, but for everybody more generally, what this means for getting more folks on the ground across the board excited. So last question, will women, will the 20% barrier that we've seen in Congress, will that be broken? I think so. Just Margie. I mean, you know, I... Hopefully, hopefully a little bit. I mean, right? We, like, it's like the same quote. We can't do it, you know, we can do it just as badly, right? We can hopefully <laughs> do it a little bit better. Andrea? Yes. Very good. We'll leave on that optimistic note. <laughs> Thank you all.